Well, hello, St. Matthew Church family. It's good to be with you here again today. I'm happy to report to you that Ronald Jackson and Gary Martin are, are back home from the hospital. Uh, they're better, but they still have a lot of improvement that needs to be made. And let's just keep praying for them that their recovery will be speedy and will be complete. Praise the Lord. Please continue to to keep praying not only for them, but for all of our congregation uh, that have needs because we have many in our congregation that need a touch from the Lord. You know, God is a, a good God. And he said he sent his word to heal us of all our diseases. Aren't you glad that he did that? Well, we're just so privileged to have the wonderful, wonderful treasure of Jesus Christ in our life and all that that means to us. And so we're so grateful this morning that we belong to the Lord. Amen. Now, our plan is to start back having the Sunday worship services next Sunday, February the 7th. And I'm looking forward to that time when we can be together again. So please pray with me that we're going to be able to do this. Amen. Amen. Last week, we learned that the first thing the Israelites did to bring the, uh, in, to, to invade rather the land of the Canaanites was to take the time to consecrate themselves and their families and to the Lord. If we're going to be successful in defeating the enemy of God and possessing the land of our inheritance that God has promised us, we must also have clean hands and a pure heart. Did not Jesus say to his disciples, uh, and to the Pharisees, really, he said it to them, that it was not possible that he did miracles by the power of Satan because Jesus said, a house divided against itself cannot stand. Jesus is saying that we can only have authority against Satan and his satanic influences when the devil has no place in us. And we have completely yielded ourselves to God. So this place of reconsecration is an important one. And it is one that must be visited often by any Christian that has made up their mind to be more than a conqueror through Jesus Christ our Lord. We find that verse over in Romans chapter 8, verse 37. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Aren't you glad that Jesus loved us? And that is the reason that we can be more than conquerors. There is much more encouragement for us to be found in this passage of Christ. Of, of the scripture uh, about being more than a conqueror. Look with me at Romans chapter 8, beginning with the 31st verse. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Aren't you glad for that? No matter what power is coming against you and I, the power of God is greater, praise the Lord. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is he who condemns? No one, Christ Jesus who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger 
or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, nor height, nor death, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Praise God, isn't it? An encouraging word from the Lord. And we can firmly establish this truth and stand by it and be comforted by this truth. God loves us. He is for us. And since God's side always win, we must be careful to live right so we can be on God's side. If we live right, we will be on the right side. And if we're on God's side, who can stand against us? Hebrews chapter 12 verse 1 says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great crowd of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. So this is just exactly what the first order of business was in preparation to go to war with the city of Jericho. They consecrated themselves unto the Lord. Then God afterwards does this shock and awe incredible moment that put such fear in the enemy of the Israelites that their enemies are paralyzed and weak and all their hope and strength has gone from them. God caused the river Jordan to be divided so the Israelites could cross over on dry land. This is both a reminder of the past victory over Pharaoh and the Egyptian army over 40 years ago and a forewarning of the doom and destruction that was soon to come upon the Canaanites. The shock and awe moment. It always follows God's people when they consecrate themselves. We are right at this moment anticipating another shock and awe moment from God when he will display his righteousness, his splendor, and his power before us. Hallelujah. I am looking forward to what God is about to do. Now back to our scripture. And God tells Joshua that there is one more thing he needs to do before they're ready to meet the enemy in the place of war. The man must be circumcised. You see, circumcision was an outward physical sign that these people belonged to God. But when Jesus came, he started a new and a better covenant. He came to create a circumcision of the heart. That would affect all appearances of conduct and actions, and it would be a better covenant and a better result than the one that was before. Because you might be circumcised in your flesh, but you might still not uh, honor God in your heart. But when you honor God in your heart, when you love him with all your heart, I tell you, it just takes care of all the issues concerning the appearances that happen in our conduct. Because our beliefs flow from out of our heart and are manifested into the world. As newborn Christians, 
you and I have been changed from the inside out. We're not the same way that we used to be, but we're new creatures in Jesus Christ. The past has passed away, and all things have become new in Christ Jesus. And because the enemy has no place in us, we are ready to make war on the enemy and win the victory. The Bible tells, the Bible rather, does not tell us how many men were circumcised. But we do know that no man born in the last 40 years had been circumcised. So it included all the ones that had been born and were at least of the age of 40 and below. In the natural, the time after circumcision would have been the right time for the enemy to attack and try to destroy the Israelites. But you know, God had put such a fear in them that they remained shut up in their walled city, afraid to face them. The people of God had all the time they needed to recover and get completely well again. You know, sometimes when we are in life's path and life's journey, we could find ourselves as Christians having failed in some way. Maybe we failed in our, uh, our faith, or, or maybe we've let fear or unbelief come into our heart. Or maybe because of the circumstances of life that we found ourselves in, we've, uh, we've um, uh, interacted with someone or spoken to someone in a wrong way or caused, let an attitude creep up that is not pleasing to God, that's affected a behavior. And, you know, the truth of the matter is that God has covered all of that. God has covered everything. And we might feel like that we can't afford to humble ourselves before us, and before others rather. We can't afford to confess our weaknesses and the error of our way. But do you know that the Lord said that the time of consecration is also a time when he will protect you. If you and I will humble ourselves and repent. God says, I will cover you. I will protect you. And we don't have to be fearful. When we find someone that is trustworthy, that we can confess our faults one to another. We don't have to be fearful that we'll have a loss of reputation or that we'll no longer have any influence that we can help someone. But you know, I have discovered that when my leaders would humble themselves and say, I am sorry, I, wrong, I was wrong, and I want to ask you to forgive me. It never caused them to come down, in my opinion. Actually, it caused them to go up in my respect and honor for them. It takes a big person to recognize and confess before others, I was wrong, please forgive me. And I want you to know that just as God protected the children of Israel during the time when they were doing the circumcision of the flesh, they needed time to heal. But God will also protect you. He'll put you under a covering of protection. And those that you confess to, well, they will not seek that as an opportunity to harm it or hurt you. No, they'll rally to you and they'll support you. And I'll tell you something else. God will keep the enemy away when you are doing something that honors him this way. Hallelujah. And we all have times where we just have to come before the Lord and say, God, just forgive me. Just forgive me. And sometimes we have to confess before others. But the Bible says in the book of James, if we confess our faults to others, that he's, he will faithfully forgive us. But also, if we are sick, we will be healed. Amen. There are a lot of things about the spirit world that we do not understand. But I'll tell you what. God has a way that brings blessing and life to us. But we need to humble ourselves and follow him in all his ways. 
Well, back to our story today. And then the day came that the army of Israel under Joshua's command attacked the city of Jericho. They walked around the city once every day for six days. But then on the seventh day, they walked around it seven times. And they walked around the first six days in complete silence. And the first six times on the seventh day in complete silence, except for seven trumpeters that sounded out the alarm on the trumpets every day as they walked. But the people were cautioned, do not speak at all. Then on that seventh day, the army of Israel walked around the walls of Jericho. The first six times, as I said before, they were silent. But then, the last time around, they gave up a shout. Now let's see what the Bible says, how God gave them the victory that day. Joshua chapter 6, beginning with the 8th verse. When Joshua had spoken to the people, the seven priests carrying the seven trumpets before the Lord went forward, blowing their trumpets, and the ark of the Lord's covenant followed them. The armed guard marched ahead of the priest who blew the trumpets, and the rear guard followed the ark. All this time the trumpets were sounding. But Joshua had commanded the army, do not give a war cry, do not raise your voices, do not say a word until the day I tell you to shout, and then shout. So he had the ark of the Lord carried around the city, circling it once, then the army returned to the camp and spent the night there. Joshua got up the next morning and the priest took up the ark of the Lord. The seven priests carrying the seven trumpets went forward, marching before the ark of the Lord and blowing the trumpets. The armed men went ahead of them and the rear guard followed the ark of the Lord while the trumpets kept sounding. So on the second day, they marched around the city once and returned to the camp. They did this for six days. On the seventh day, they got up at, day at daybreak and marched around the city seven times in the same manner, except that on that day, they circled the city seven times. The seventh time around, when the priest sounded the trumpet blast, Joshua commanded the army, Shut! For the Lord has given you the city. The city and all that is in it are to be devoted to the Lord. Only Rahab the prostitute and all who are with her in her house shall be spared. Because she hid the spies we sent. Then I'm skipping on to verse 20. When the trumpet sounded, the army shouted. And the sound of the trumpet sounded. And when the men gave a loud shout, the wall collapsed. So everyone charged right in and they took the city. In our time of fighting the good fight of faith, there are times when we just need to be quiet. The temptation is to open our mouths and complain. And if we're not careful, we'll start talking about how big our problem is instead of praising God for how big our God is. And before we know what has happened, we will have talked ourselves right out of the victory and lose all faith in God. Sometimes we just need to suffer in silence. Oh, but, but there comes a time when we must open our mouths and shout for the victory because God has given us the victory just like God had given the city of Jericho over to the Israelites. 
When we shout in faith, when we shout for joy, when we say, I know I have the victory because Jesus has said so in his word, then the walls of the, the walls, they just start to fall down. The walls that have hindered us, the walls that had helped us in and kept our freedom and kept us from being able to do the things that we want to do, to do the things that we've been asking God to help us do, they just come crashing down. I'll tell you something. There is a time for silence, but there is a time for a shout. Recently, I heard of a dream that God had given someone of what happened at the battle of Jericho. In this dream, God just opened up his eyes where he could see in the spirit what was happening. In the dream, he saw the war angels of the Lord, and they were standing shoulder to shoulder all around the walls of Jericho. And when the trumpets sounded on, and the people began to shout and began to praise the Lord, God showed him that these angels all at the same time started pressing down on those walls and the angels pushed those walls right down into the ground so that the Israelite army could rush into the city all at the same time and completely destroy it. I mean, they pushed the walls right on down into the ground. See, that's one of our weapons. So don't forget that God has sent angels to help you. Hebrews 1.14 tells us that the angels are sent forth to assist those who are called unto salvation. One of the great tools that God has given us is a host of angels that he has sent to help us. When the angels hear us speak words of faith that align themselves with the words of God, then they are released to complete their assignment from God on our behalf. We, we always want to be careful that we use our words to release our angels on our behalf rather than using words that coming out of our mouth that binds them. We don't want to bind our angels. We want to release them. So another very important weapon that God has given us is our words. When our words are aligned with God's words. Our words enable our angels to complete the assignment that God has given them. They assist us and deliver into our hands the victory we need. The last weapon of spiritual warfare that I want to talk about today is the weapon that God has given us when we pray in the Spirit in a heavenly language. The Apostle Paul tells us in Romans chapter 8 something about this. He says, beginning with the 26th verse of chapter 8. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our heart knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. Let me say that again. The Spirit, and that's capitalized, it means the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit intercedes for you and for me in accordance with what? The will of God. He knows the will of God, and that's how he's praying for us, that we will experience the will of God. Verse 28. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him and who have been called according to his purpose. Obviously, God is not saying that all things that happen to us are God working good things for us. Because you and I have lived long enough to know that not everything that has happened to us is a good thing. We've all seen a lot of trouble. We've all suffered a lot of pain. 
And we know that not everything that has happened to us happened to us for the purpose of the will of God in our lives. No, rather, God is saying that all things that we pray in the Spirit, God works those things for the good of those who love Him and who are called according to His purpose. When we pray in the Spirit, we're praying perfect prayers through our spirit to God who Himself is a spirit. It is impossible to miss the mark when we pray in the Spirit because the Holy Spirit who abides in us knows exactly what it is that we need. And when we let Him pray through us, those perfect prayers have great authority with God to accomplish His purpose in us and in the world in which He has placed us. Perhaps you have not yet been filled with this gift of the Holy Spirit, with the evidence of speaking in tongues. Well, you certainly can have this gift from God. The Bible tells us over in the book of Acts, chapter 2, when Peter tells over 3,000 people there, he says, beginning with the 38th verse, Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. Now I know you. I know you in my congregation. You have repented of your sins. You are saved and have received the forgiveness of your sins. But perhaps you have not yet asked God to fill you with the Holy Spirit. But I assure you that this is your gift for the asking. Just receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. In the same way you receive Jesus Christ as your Savior. Believe that God has given you this gift and by faith receive it. Confess it with your mouth and believe it in your heart. When you do at some point in time, not always when you first pray for it, God will overshadow you and baptize you with the Holy Spirit. When you pray in faith believing, that's when it happens. But just as all things that we have and get from through faith, believing in God, don't always immediately manifest, you might not immediately experience speaking in tongues. But I assure you, if you will hold on to your profession of faith, and not give up, but just keep seeking the Lord. In due season, you will receive the fullness, including the manifestations of speaking in tongues, which we receive to be the evidence of its coming and a continual evidence of the presence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We know that when we get saved, the Holy Spirit comes to live within us. He indwells us right then. But this is a greater blessing, and God wants you to have it. This gift will enable you to pray in a heavenly language that only God understands. And the one praying it through you will be the Holy Spirit who abides in you already. And because it is the Holy Spirit who searches the heart of men, when he prays through you, the prayers you pray will be the perfect will of God for you, for whatever you need. He will pray perfectly for you, the will of God. Now, so many times we're in dilemmas and we don't even know how to pray. But the Holy Spirit knows how to pray and what to pray for in a perfectly way on your behalf every time. This experience 
is a life changer. And I want you to begin asking God for it and seeking him until you are fully filled with his spirit, with the evidence of speaking in tongues. You know, this is the one gift of all of the gifts of the spirit. The devil don't want you to have your personal prayer language. He does not want you to have a direct line between the Holy Spirit and God on your behalf. He fights this in the body of Christ, I believe, more than anything else. But I tell you what, it's a blessing that God has given to you. And I have enjoyed it. It has dramatically changed my life. I feel like I owe every sincere a meaningful blessing in my life to this gift in one way or another. I've told you my story many times. I've told you the miracles that God has done in my life as we were working on the farm, how God brought the cloud out from the Gulf of Mexico that overshadowed our farm. And in all of almost America, there was no produce but ours because God saved it that day. What was I doing? Running up and down the roads, praying in the spirit as God led me to. That is just only one example. There are many more examples. I got divine strategies that enabled us to prosper and gave us uh, understanding and wisdom and told us what to do. It was because I was praying in the spirit and then God gave me understanding. I tell you, this precious gift is for you. And I want you to have it. And God wants you to have it. So I'm asking you, to be seeking and asking God to put a hunger upon your life and your heart to be filled with the precious Holy Spirit. Now let us pray. In fact, why not pray a simple prayer with me and receive the gift of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. By faith, just receive it. Heavenly Father, why don't you just repeat it after me wherever you are? No one probably is around, but if they are, they won't care. Just go ahead and repeat it. Heavenly Father, thank you for saving me. And thank you for forgiving me of my sins. Thank you that my name is written in the book of life. And I know that I will live with you forever. I heard the words in your Bible that said that this gift of the baptism of the Holy Spirit is for anyone who believes and who is called, and that means who is saved. I have given my heart to you, and I want this special gift that you promised to give to me so that I may receive the overcoming, breakthrough anointing and power that you want for me to have in my life. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for filling me with the fullness of the Holy Spirit, which I receive by faith in Jesus' name. I pray. Amen. 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 I encourage you. Keep hungry for God. Keep honoring Him and praising Him and drawing near to Him. He is going to surprise you with the overshadowing of His presence. You're going to be praying to Him at some point. You're going to be seeking his face and earnestly seeking him and honoring him. And the unction is going to come right up here. Now when that comes, it'll be your job to speak it out. God will bring it to you, but you must deliver it. For he put you in control of the words that come out of your mouth. 
So if you will cooperate, you'll go right through. And the language that will come will not be a language that you understand. But it will be a language that God understands. Hallelujah. And God will bless you. He'll empower you. He'll give you divine strategies. He will show you the way when you do not know it. He'll bring a peace that you've not known before. He'll increase the love for others that you already have. He'll help you to fulfill the plan that he has for you in his heart. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I know you love him now. But this is going to be a blessing. And he wants you to have it. So embrace it. Receive it. And enjoy the blessings of God. I want to tell you that I love you. And I appreciate every one of you. And my prayer is that the, the Lord will bless you. And that the Lord will keep you till we meet again. And I truly hope to see you next week right here at 11 o'clock for our Sunday morning worship service. Pray with me that the Lord will open that door. Hallelujah. Amen. God bless you.